Good morning. How's everyone doing? Are we all good? It's lovely to be with you. For those of you that I met yesterday, it's lovely to see your faces again. For new faces that I've not met before, um, like Ben Sher and I'm Rachel, the other half of Judah. And uh, thank you so much, Nikki. Um, and I was thinking, um, it's ironic, it's Judah's birthday today. And uh, he's 41, and it's the 20th anniversary since I met him. So that's cool, isn't it? So I met him when he was just a little uh, 21-year-old. He looked about 12 when we got married. When we were on our honeymoon, this is a true story, people asked if we were there with our mum and dad. And we were like, we're like, we're on our honeymoon. And they genuinely thought we were 12. Then we moved into our first house in Salford. And the kids used to knock on the door to ask Judah to play out because they thought he was about 12. And I was like, he's married. He's hanging out with me, love. So um, anyway, so we have been together. Well, not together. We've known each other for 20 years today. Uh, been married for 18 years. And uh, like Ben shared, we live in a wonderful place called Liverpool. Any of you guys been up to Liverpool? few of you best city best city. we've been there for over 12 years now and we have two scouse children and uh one of the things i prayed when uh, we knew that god was calling us to church plant was like god i will go anywhere except birmingham or liverpool i'm really sorry if anyone's from birmingham today um, i was like i do not want kids that have brummy or scouse accents so god completely did not listen to my prayer and i have two scouse children and um, me and judah try and give them elocution lessons and it has not worked so they regularly speak scouse to us and we try and correct them. So our little boy Jack is seven and he says things like, close my door. And I'm like, no, that's not how we speak, love. Um, so, uh, but we love Liverpool in all seriousness. It is the best city um, because it's where God's called us to be. So if you're where God's called you to be, then Coventry is the best city for you. And um, we love what God's doing across the UK. We're passionate about what he's doing on our doorstep. And I was sharing a little bit yesterday with the guys in Ben and Charlotte's house that um, I've been to different countries, but do you know, the place where I get most excited to see God move is here in England, in the UK, and because I'm passionate about our country, I'm passionate about what God wants to continue to do in our country. So I want to, um, also another thing I just wanted to share was that yesterday Judah and I were driving to my mom and dad's. They live in, in near Warwick. I don't know if you guys know Warwick around that area. And uh, we were saying this is an amazing church family. I'm not just saying that for nice flattery, just to give you guys a compliment. But yesterday we were sat there and we were like, what a wonderful group of people. Honestly, you've created this amazing family. And sometimes when you're in something, you can take it for granted that you don't realize how good it is. And we came away yesterday and we were like, what a wonderful church family you guys have honestly if I move back to the Midlands I would want to be in this church family I'm not saying that as a false flattery it is a lovely community God is doing an amazing thing here anyway I'll stop rambling and um, so today I want to encourage you with a word that God has put on my heart um, and it all starts back to when me and Judah were first dating so you have to go with me on this uh, this story because it might take a while before I get to my spiritual point um, so uh, we started dating back beginning of 2003 and uh, Judah knew that one of my love languages was gifts which makes me straight away sound like I'm really shallow but I unadmittedly unashamedly love getting a gift so um he bought me some earrings and he he thought because I was a really gracious person um that uh, I was really happy with these earrings these aren't the earrings but just imagine these being the earrings okay and uh, and I was like oh thanks babe they're lovely and actually they were hideous and um he just kept buying me more and more earrings because every time I said thanks because I was so gracious and kind um I think he just thought I loved them. So he just kept buying me more and more earrings. And honestly, guys, I sound like I'm really ungrateful, but they were hideous, absolutely hideous. And he just kept buying me them. And then I would put them in the drawer and I'd pray, God, please let him not ask where the earrings are. So I put them in the drawer. I never bin them. I just kind of hid them away. And this kept going on and on until one day Judah clocked on and he was like, Rach, I don't know if I've ever seen you wear any of the earrings I bought you. And I was like, that's because I haven't. <laughs> um, and then I had to let him know. I was like, if I'm being really brutally honest, babe, they're hideous. Um, and by this point we've got to a place of comfortableness in our relationship so I felt like I could be brutally honest and um, one of the things you learn in Liverpool is that they're brutally honest um, and uh, anyway so after that honestly years went by and I never received another pair of earrings and I was like praise the Lord he's got the message and um, fast forward to our 15th wedding anniversary and we went to stay at a hotel where we spent our wedding night so it's a romantic little weekend away and um, I come out of the bathroom and there on the side is a Tiffany box any girl in this room would get excited I'm sure of a Tiffany box so I see this box and I'm like I'm so excited I'm like please let this be what I think it is I go over to this box open it up and there is a pair of Tiffany earrings I don't know if Noah if we've got a picture of them okay these are the earrings a pair of Tiffany earrings honestly 
I cried. This is how shallow I am. I cried because I was so excited by this pair of earrings. And uh, for the first time in our whole marriage, I thought the boy has done well. He has done well. Um, <laughs> but no, I sound really shallow, don't I? Um, so anyway, so I had these earrings and honestly, I love them so much. I never took them off. So I would go swimming. I would have a shower. I'd go to work. I'd sleep. And I literally never took these earrings off. And, uh, Loved them, thought they were amazing. And then about a year after this, um, we were going to a conference to see, to hear a guy called Danny Silk speak in Wolverhampton. We get in the car with our friends. I realize I'm missing an earring and I'm like, I've lost one of the earrings. Honestly, my heart sunk. I was like absolutely devastated. The whole journey there, couldn't, everyone else is worshiping, having a great time. I'm like in a proper grump because I'm like, I've lost this earring. No idea where it is. Um, three weeks go by and this earring is missing. And I pray to God and I say, God, I love you, God. And I know that you care about every little detail of our life. And um, I don't want to sound shallow, God, but I really want that earring back. And um, so I pray. The next day, I'm walking out my house across like the doormat outside the front of our house. I walk, honestly... 20 times a day backwards and forwards through that door and there in the middle of my doormat is this shiny little Tiffany earring and I'm like hallelujah find this earring and put it back in and I'm like right God you know I've learnt my lesson let's not lose that earring again get on with life um, about another year goes by and uh, I realise one day going out to work I've lost my earring again so this is like year two of the earring I've lost it but this time it's more than three days it's missing for three months and literally I've given up all hope of finding this earring I saw the little sad earring sat on the side of my room with no partner and I'd lost all hope of finding this earring. Anyway, this friend comes around to help me clean, got young kids. I'm like, I need help. She comes around to help me clean. She finds it three months later down the side of our sofa, which is probably where most of us find half our house, isn't it? Down the side of the sofa. So I find this earring. Again, I'm just like, thank you, Jesus. Found this earring back in my ear. Okay. Another year goes by, year three of owning these Tiffany earrings. And um, we're at a car dealership in Liverpool trying to find a car because our car's died. My little boy, Jack, is having an absolute meltdown. Have you ever had those moments you're trying to look like all you know got it together and your child's kicking off and having a meltdown and um, so I kind of grab him like this and walking out the car dealership feeling like the worst mum in the world and he's like scrabbling his hands around he knocks the earring out my ear but I don't realize this we get in the car I'm like we're never going back to that car dealership ever again get in the car driving home look in the mirror one of my earrings is missing so then I make Judah phone up because I'm like too stressed he phones up says oh, my wife's lost her earring you know any chance you can find it he's like no no sign of an earring here so I'm like right okay that's that is just the end of my earring. There's no chance I'm going to find it. A week later, Judah gets an email. Dear, Ju dear Mr. Cole, um, just letting you know, we found an earring on the courtyard of our car yard, a Tiffany earring. It's bent, bruised, scratched. The little pointy bit is completely bent. It looks like a wreck. Would your wife like it back? And I'm like, yes, of course I would like it back. So I get this earring back. And honestly, it's scratched, bent. The thing that pokes in your ears like this, um, it's complete wreck. But honestly, I cried. I was on like cloud 999 that I finally had my earring back. And then at this point, this is when the Holy Spirit started to speak to me. Because sometimes, I don't know if you're like this, but God has to speak to me about a billion times before I actually wake up and listen and realize that he wants to say something. And he said, Rachel, he said, this is what I do. I bring what is lost home. And he said it really simply to me. And I said, oh, okay. Um, and then he continued to speak to me and he said, you know, my children may turn their back on me. They may go off and just live life their own way, do their own thing. But I would go anywhere to bring my children home to me. And you know, when I got my earring back, I didn't care the state it was in. I didn't care that it was all scratched and bent and potentially probably could never wear it again. Um, I was just happy to have it back. And you know, with Jesus, when us, when our friends, when our family come to know Jesus, when Coventry, when the cities, when Liverpool, when places that we're passionate about come to know Jesus, you know, just imagine how God is. He's just so happy to have those people in his family and in his life. And I love the fact I was thinking about this this morning, that God meets us where we're at. He meets us in our mess. He meets us in our brokenness and he still chooses to love us. When we're the most broken, messed up people, he still chooses to love us. He doesn't hold on to our past. He doesn't hold on to the mess that we've created and the brokenness in our lives. When we come to 
to Jesus and we truly say sorry, we repent and we turn from living life that way. He is such a good father. He sees the good in us. He sees the gold in us and he rejoices and he celebrates simply to have us home, doesn't he? And I love that about God. And I was thinking as well that, um, a lot of my stories relate to Jack, our little boy, because he's a little bit wild at times. And um, I was thinking about our little boy, Jack. And uh, a couple of years ago, Judah had gone out to put the bins in our street in Liverpool. And he'd gone to put the bins out. He'd left our front door open for 30 seconds. So you can imagine what came next. So uh, somebody escaped, but we didn't know he'd escaped out of the house. And, uh, and we're just in the house. Judah comes back in. We sit down in the lounge. It's all quiet. And the most common phrase you ever hear in our house is, where's Jack? It's literally the thing I say about 500 times a day. Um, and uh, suddenly I turned to Judah and I go, where's Jack? I said, I don't know. I thought he was in the house. We searched the house. Nowhere to be seen. Searched the garden. Nowhere to be seen. By this point, about five minutes has gone by. So I'm like, he could be literally in Anfield Stadium by now. He's literally gone, gone out the street, down the road. I'm like, where could he be? So I panic. I go out the house with no shoes on, pegging it down our street. I'm like, Jack! It's like shouting his name, trying to find him. Eventually, I find him down the next road, down a cul-de-sac, stood at someone's door in his pyjamas, holding Judah's slippers in both hands, about to knock on the door of this random house. And I'm like, Jack, I find him. And if, has anyone here ever lost a child before? Yeah, okay, Pat, I'll just chat to you then. <laughs> um, it's like the worst feeling in the world. Suddenly, I was saying sorry to God that I really cared about the earrings because they were suddenly insignificant compared to losing a child. Um, so I find him. I don't know whether to kiss him because I'm so happy I found him or like throttle him because I'm so angry that he's ran out of the house. Um, I had... May, may have had slight stern words with him when I found him. Um, but I was just so happy to find my child, to get him back and bring him back to our house, to his family where he belonged. And again, this happened not long after my earring incident. And God spoke to me really clearly. And he said, Rachel, and it's like he's like having to shout it from the, from the rooftops. Rachel, this is what I do. I bring what is lost home. Um, and I believe that there's no place like home. You know, you know that from a famous movie, but there is no place like home. And I just want to, if I can play it through my phone, um, me and Judah help with an event called Awakening Europe and we go out there to help with the outreach and uh, we were out there a couple of years ago in a place called Prague has anyone been to Prague? It's a very cool cool place um, and we're there in a worship time and there's a, a girl leading worship called Amanda Cook from Bethel Church and she starts singing this prophetic song if I can get it up playing on here Aha, give me one second I've turned my phone to aeroplane mode so that might help um, one second So she starts singing this song and, you know, all this stuff's been, God's been speaking to me about. Um. Anyway, sorry, you can't hear that well. But she starts singing this song and she starts just singing on repeat for about five minutes. There's no place you won't go to bring your children home. And that's literally all she just kept singing. She kept singing, there's no place you won't go to bring your children home. And bear in mind, I've just gone on this epic journey with my earring, with God speaking to me, with Jack. And uh, it was like God was just shouting it at me again. And he was like, Rachel, there is no place that I won't go to bring my children home. This random, well, not random, she's amazing, but this lady, this worship leader from America is there. We're in another place called Prague. And God is speaking to me the same message again about what he would do. Um, I just want to say that to you guys today, you know, when you're thinking, we were praying before, weren't we, from Jen's uh, word that she bought, and we were praying, and, and we were praying and believing for those people in our life where we want to, want to see God make a way in their life, that there's no place that God won't go to bring those people we pray for today home. And um, so Amanda, Amanda sang this song, I remember just like weeping, snotting tears down my face, um, and God showed me again his incredible desire and heart to bring his sons and daughters and his children back to him into a perfect relationship with of the heavenly father just as God intended it to be and honestly every time God's spoken to this it might sound so simple to you but honestly it's reaffirmed something in my heart that you know we look at people and sometimes you can think they're too far gone from God they're too broken and um, they're too like atheist whatever but honestly God there's no place he will not go to bring his children back to him so that they can have an incredible relationship with him 
So I want to read a story from the Bible today. We'll bring it up behind now, if that's okay. Um, and it's a story that you may have read a bazillion times, but today we're going to read it a bazillion and one times. And it is the parable of the lost son. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It's from Luke chapter 15. You can follow along behind, or if you've got a Bible or a device. Um, I'm going to read from verse 11, and this is how the story goes. It says, Um, Jesus said to them, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told the father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and began to starve. And he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him but no one gave him anything when he finally came to his senses he said to himself at home even the hired servants have enough food to spare and here i am dying of hunger i will go home to my father and say father i have sinned against both heaven and you and i'm no longer worthy to be called your son please take me on as a hired servant so he returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off his father saw him coming filled with love and compassion he ran to his son embraced him and kissed him his son said to him father I have sinned against both heaven and you and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son but his father said to the servants quick bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening we must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life he was lost but now he is found so the party began Began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he told him, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. The father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And I just think you may have read this story a load of times. You may have read it from when you were a small child. Um, But this story always reminds me again and again that this is God's plan for us as his children, that he wants to bring his children home. And I believe that now is the time that he wants to bring his children home. Today is the day to see children come back to him. So what does this story mean? It gets me every time. I believe that the younger brother looked for love, but love was at home. Okay. He looked for understanding, but that was at home too. He looked for comfort, but he'd left that at home too. He looked for companionship and acceptance, but he'd left that at home too. Everything that he needed, he had at home with his father. So here is this young man. He has everything that he needed, but it's at home with his father. He's now out there feeding pigs. No matter how much you like feeding pigs, I'm sure that's a a proper desperate place to be in. He's there feeding the pigs and, uh, you know, just, just, living off the food that the pigs would eat and I just think that can't have been any glamorous place that he was in he's he's got to this place of absolute brokenness and um you know God is a God of second chances he's an awesome God a God of second chances we know that don't we and when we look at the father in this story he chose not to focus on the lifestyle that his younger son had been living um the fact that he'd gone away, the fact that he'd run off to do his own thing, squander his money. Um, but he chose to simply run towards him with open arms and just to love him unconditionally and welcome, welcome him back into his family and into his home. There was absolutely no judgment, just forgiveness and love. And I think that's so powerful. And we hear this and we say, that's how I'm going to be as a Christian. This is how I'm going to be with people. But it doesn't always equate to that. We don't always respond in that same way. And, you know, as a side note, I just want to say that the God we serve and love is a God of grace and understanding. Okay, he's a God of patience and of long suffering. He's a God of mercy and a God of compassion. 
And if you're here today and you feel like you have fallen by the wayside or maybe someone that you love, someone close to you, a friend or a family member, I just want to say there is fresh hope here today. Um, You know, we don't have to twist God's arm to take us back into his family. We don't have to to persuade him. And he's not like reluctant to say, oh, yeah, I just welcome you back in. Um, God is there uh, with arms wide open, ready to take us back into his family. There is restoration for us every single day. Um, Restoration for us, for our friends, for our family that maybe we're we're praying for um, and God is welcoming his precious children home today and in this story the father went out of his way to make the way clear for his lost son to come home he didn't allow the brother or the son's mistakes to get in the way of his son coming home it was a place where the son could be secure significant and valued and I just think that is incredible and right now we think about Coventry I don't know which bits you guys live in you might live in surrounding areas Leamington Kenilworth wherever it might be Um, but this place is all around here where there are people right now and they are screaming out for help trust me in my job in Liverpool I work for a charity and I look after 55 homeless houses and in these homeless houses these people every day are some of the most broken people and I sit with them and they cry and they literally they just want to know that somebody cares someone is interested in their life somebody loves them and someone will walk with them through the messiness of their life and and the privilege to be able to bring Jesus into their situations honestly there is nothing greater than that and there's people right now in Coventry I don't know all the people here um, but there's people that you will see every day and do you know what they don't have to live on a street bench for them to be in need they don't have to be in a homeless shelter to be desperately crying out for someone to love them and and show an interest in their life and bring Jesus there yes I have a massive passion for homeless people but you know what I just have a passion for God's people and I think you know there's people that God places in our lives at the school gates um, you know in your workplace wherever it may be every day that he wants us to go into their situation and bring the uncle conditional love of Jesus just like the father in this story and um, and you know I, I want to pray for us later that we will um, have those eyes and hearts wide open that we will we won't be too busy for those people that we will have time to go to the people that God puts into our life you know, I want to challenge us. You know, I came in here today and honestly, the welcome is lovely. The, it, this, I said it before, but this is a wonderful church. You know, but as a church, and we say this to our own church in Liverpool, are we a church that is willing to go out of our way to welcome in people with open arms? Sometimes in church services, we can be so busy getting ready for our service to start, so busy with getting the teas and coffees ready and the band ready. And all those things are wonderful. And I say this as a church leader with Judah in, in our church. Um, but, you know, we have to remember that the point is that we're here to see the gospel proclaims and to see people added to our church family to become disciples of Jesus and we don't want to miss the main point do we and I think it's just remembering that we are a church family that would welcome whoever God brings into our arms and um you know, there's a, when we were living in Salford, so we were from Manchester before we moved to Liverpool, we planted a church into Salford, and uh, this girl started coming to our church called Emma, she's still a really good friend of mine now, and she started coming, and uh, she was from a bit of a wild background, she loved the party party scene, loved the drug scene, came to our church, we loved her, um, the church was amazing with her, she gave her life to Jesus, and we had a weekend away at Kevin Lee, anyone been to Kevin Lee? Classic Kevin Lee, love it, we went to uh, Kevin Lee, she got baptised and water and she had a powerful encounter with Jesus and uh, it was amazing but sometimes we've seen this happen time and time again people get baptized in water and it's like the enemy tries to sneak on in there and just pull them back a little bit into their old life and sure enough a week or two went by and she kind of vanished off our radar didn't she and we were trying to ring her she changed mobile numbers she moved flats to a different flat in Salford where we were living and uh, and we just we couldn't get hold of her and I was like holy spirit I really want to pursue this lady I love her and I don't want to see her just go back into her old ways. And then I remember the only bit of information I remembered about her life was the fact that she worked at a betting shop. Um, so I'm there with my daughter, traipsing around every betting shop in Salford, trying to find this lady. And uh, I remember it was the final one we went into just by the precinct. I went in there and I stood there and she was working behind this big counter. And uh, she just came out. I didn't even say anything. She just came over to me and she just hugged me and she cried. I cried. Um, and I remember just thinking like, this this is what God would do for us. He would literally pursue us to the ends of the earth. And uh, and she all she said to me was she in between tears and hugging me. She just said, "I'm so sorry." She came back to our church. She got so plugged in. She met a guy. They got married. Um, we were there helping at their wedding. And uh, it uh, she's serving God in a place called Berry near Manchester. And I love the fact that you know God's hand is on her life and that He's using her in a beautiful way. 
But I could have just ignored her in that moment. I could have thought, you know what, you know, God, 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 she knows God loves her and just left her to, uh, to carry on with her life. And maybe there are times to do that. But I do believe that sometimes God wants us to pursue those people and go after those people and see them come into all that God has for them, like with our friend Emma. Are we all good? You know, the father in this story of the prodigal son went out of his way and uh, just, you know, going out of our way isn't always convenient. You know, we live busy lives. We have jobs, we have children and, you know, post COVID, I don't know about you, but sometimes I like being in my house a little bit too much and uh, Judah's like kicking me out the door and I've probably at times become a little bit too comfortable with my own house. And do you know what? You know, I believe that this is a, a new season for us and that we need to be prepared to do things that sometimes feel a little bit inconvenient and maybe don't fit into the normal everyday pattern of our life. Um, but, you know, by running, when we look at the story of this father, by running, he took on shame and probably potential ridicule from the people in his town watching. He ran in order to love and protect his son. And the son wasn't left to uh, walk a walk of shame, which I love. I just think how powerful is that? He wasn't left to just walk a, a walk of shame and be left to look so embarrassed. The father went out of his way to make it easy for the son to come home. And do we go out of our way as a church family for people to come home? Because we want to create an environment which hosts the presence of God. And you've done that beautifully today. But we make it so easy for people to come in and be a part of us. We don't want to be exclusive. You know, it's easy to stick with the people that we know and the people that are like us and the people that we feel safe with but just think of that new person coming in you know do we welcome them in with open arms and say this is home this is a place where you can know true family you know and I just you know it's a conviction for me as much as I'm sure it is for all of us but how are we do we make it easy for people to come in and be part of our family and part of our home you know we want to create a home where people far from God people that are living in the most broken desperate situations can come in and find an incredible welcome we had an incredible welcome from Nikki on the door today. And I believe that like, God wants it from the moment we come into contact with Christians. God wants us to know what it is to be at home with him and at home with his people. You know, God wants to see people saved, but saved into a family. And this is an amazing family. And I said it before, you know, the words of Dorothy from Wizard of Oz, she says in it, there's no place like home. And honestly, the biggest thing I've realized post COVID is that I love church. I love church family. And there is no place like being in God's family and being at home in God's family. And you have a mountain of people out here in Coventry that are looking for a home. They're looking for Jesus and they're looking for a home. And, um, and I love the fact that there is so much opportunity around you here and that you have people bursting with love and compassion I think of Paul and honestly he's like one of my favorite people in the world and Paul Paul caused a lot of mischief at our wedding um <laughs> stealing ladders off photographers you may remember um but when I first met Paul in Manchester this man has got the biggest heart of compassion for people and I remember watching him in action with different homeless people and people that God brought into our church in Manchester and and I believe that there's many Pauls in this church that have got big hearts of compassion um and that God has people that he wants to bring your way and he's just looking for people to say you know I'm not perfect God but I'm here I'm willing I'm available I'm a vessel ready to be used by you and I want to see the lost come home um, and yeah, I'm excited for what God's going to do with you and through you. Um, but I want to pray. I'm going to invite Judah to come up and we're going to spend some time praying with you guys, if that's all right. Do you want to come up, Jude? Um, so we just want to pray with you guys, if that's all right. Shall I hand over to you? Um, I'm just going to read from Isaiah chapter 61. And I really believe today that God wants to... Uh, commission uh, some people here for the work of evangelism and as I read this if as I read you just sense God beginning to move in your heart it might just be that you just have like a tingling inside or uh, you begin to sense hold on God I feel like you're just here with me in this moment um, then I, I think that's maybe an invitation. It's God's way of saying, I want to use you particularly in evangelism. And so I'm going to read this. And if you sense uh, God is uh, speaking to you, moving in you, um, then I want you to be really, really bold and brave and just put your hand up. And I'm just going to pray for you. Um, and that this moment would be a moment that marks you. And that uh, you step over into a new season where 
uh, it's not that you'll be the finished product, but you'll begin a journey of growing in boldness, in uh, being equipped, in going and preaching the gospel. And however that looks, you may end up in the world of Alpha or doing stuff on the street, or I don't know how it'll look for you, but I do believe that uh, God has uh, really spoken to me about here today and for some people here that uh, he wants to use in a new and fresh way in evangelism. Is that okay? Can we do that? Okay, so Isaiah 61 says this, Holy Spirit, you're here. We thank you that you're here. We just pray this time of prayer would be a moment that would lead for uh, to see many people saved. Thank you, Jesus. It says in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. He's anointed you to preach good news to the poor. He has sent you to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair that you would be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So I'm just going to pray and uh, maybe we could just close our eyes and and if that's you, just uh, if you feel like, do you know what, God, um, I believe that you're anointing me to preach the gospel, to do the work of evangelism, um, then I just want you to lift your hand up and I'd just love to pray with you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. God, right now we come before you and as we are aware, this is your house, God, you're on the throne and God, you're the one that gives out gifts, you're the one that uh, stirs our heart for different things and Lord, I just pray for those that have lifted their hands, I pray Holy Spirit, a fresh anointing for them to preach the gospel, I pray a fresh anointing on them and I pray that Uh, Today would be a a line in the sand that they step over into the call you have for them. Um, The gift of evangelism would be stirred up within them. Lord, that they would step into a fresh boldness and that you would lead them, Holy Spirit, step by step into the path and plan you have for them. Lord, I pray that you'd bring the right uh, people alongside them to stir them, encourage them and Uh, help equip them in evangelism. Lord, we just pray that today would be a day um, that is the beginning of an exciting adventure. Lord, that we would see in the years to come stories of salvation, of incredible lives change, Lord, because of the work, Holy Spirit, you are doing um, in the lives of those that have responded. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for all of us. Um, Lord, as I've been praying about this incredible church, Lord, the word I had was fresh boldness. And God, I just pray and speak fresh boldness over every one of us. Lord, I thank you that you uh, reaching the lost, loving the lost, leading people to Jesus. It's not about our personality. Lord, I thank you that for Rachel, she's an extrovert and I'm an introvert, that I'm quiet and she's loud that we're so different but it's about the anointing it's about the fact that we have mouths to open and to tell people God loves you and Lord I pray for every one of us a fresh boldness a fresh boldness I pray like God you declare to Joshua be bold be bold be bold be bold as he entered the promised land I pray for every one of us boldness. God, I thank you that your heart is that coming out of lockdown, that the 
boldness would return to us, but that we would have even new and fresh boldness. And so, God, I just speak boldness over this church, boldness over every family, boldness over every individual. Lord, where lethargy, where um, just the tiredness that I and all of us have felt because of lockdown, Lord, that that would be replaced with fresh boldness. Boldness to love the unlovable, boldness to love those that we maybe have given up on, boldness to um, love people and have the confidence to lead people to Jesus. Lord, we just speak boldness over this church in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Jesus, we just pray right now that, Father, you would just enlarge our hearts, that, Father, you would stretch our hearts wide open to receive the people that you want to bring into our life. Father, where we've said, God, I'm just at capacity. God, I just can't manage anything more in my life. Father, would you supernaturally stretch our grace, stretch our capacity, grow our compassion, grow our mercy within us, God. And, Father, that as you bring those people into our life, that somehow supernaturally, God, we would have the time for them, that, Father, we would have space in our heart for them, that, Father, we would know the words to speak to them we would know when just to listen to them when to speak father we would know when to bring a word of encouragement when to bring the truth the gospel into their life but father you would lead the way that father we wouldn't feel intimidated or scared or overwhelmed at the thought of speaking to a non-christian or someone that's in a real broken place that father you would lead us you would give us the words to speak and father we thank you that i, I prayed this yesterday but god you never lead it lead us to time wasters so holy spirit lead us to the right people jesus lead us to those that you want us to bring your gospel to you want us to bring your love to jesus and father highlight them make it so clear and evident that these are the people at this time that you want us to pour into to invest into and father thank you for this church community thank you that they have big hearts they have big capacity and that they have big grace on them and father we just pray that they would make room in their hearts to welcome those in to welcome the lost in those that are away from you jesus those that have never known you jesus and father we're excited for the people that you want to bring into this community we're excited for the people that you want us to just reach out there in the city of coventry jesus whether they never enter this building or not there's still the people that you want us to just sow seeds to to preach your gospel to and to pray for jesus so god we just thank you we thank you for what you want to do through us and in us and god we just thank you that um we get to play a little part in this big picture that we get to be a, a vessel that is willing to be used by you jesus and that is there's no greater privilege than that Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.